MCC TV is largely about what happens in the classrooms of Metropolitan Community College. We also present interviews with speakers, authors, and performers who visit our campuses. And once a quarter, we sit down with the president and the CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce to discuss the economic health and development of our viewing area. The conversation upcoming is about what happened in quarter number two of 2020 and how we have fared so far through the COVID virus and the pandemic. I'm your host, Kent Pavelka, and David Brown joins me next on MCC TV. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to you too, David, once again. I think uh, obviously our viewers, to start off with, would like to know how you feel we have managed through the pandemic this far this calendar season. Just said it's March, I guess I should say. Your, maybe your, your general assessment of that. You know, I, I think Omaha has done uh, remarkably well. I think there's, talk about walking into the unknown. I mean, you, you, you don't build a plan for this and you end up uh, having to build a plan around a pandemic um, that nobody was expecting and then around civil rights issues that nobody was expecting to explode and then the economic impact of all of that. So it, it has been a, uh, a challenging time for all of the authority, who all the folks who have the authority to build projects and build plans. Um, and it's been a challenging time for all of us too who are trying to figure out a way to help our members and help the community deal with this. But if you put us on a scale of one to 10 about how we've done in all of this, Omaha has done well. And um, I think our unemployment rate is higher than we want it to be, but it hasn't been as bad as a lot of other places. Um, our businesses seem to be doing okay right now. The bigger businesses in particular continue to have their people working remotely, but are continuing working. Our big concern probably is for those smaller companies that are particularly event and uh, retail or restaurant related who um, are just having challenges because you don't have as many people walking in the door. Um, their, their businesses basically were closed for a certain amount of time by, by edict of government. You can't have people coming in. You can't have people going out. Um, and then with College World Series, um, NCAA basketball tournament, um, the Berkshire Hathaway meeting um, you know, all, and the swim trials, those things not happening. Uh, those businesses, particularly in the downtown area that would have typically made a lot of their, their profit and their revenue from those kind of events early in the year, um, they saw a, a big gap in revenue coming in. And so those are the ones that we continue to be concerned about. We're concerned about all of them, but those that had that big impact uh, right early on in the spring, um, we're keeping a close eye on to try and make sure we can be helped any way we can. Drilling down into the numbers re regarding unemployment or employment, um, I, I'm told that, that, that employment is up May to June, but down obviously from June last year to June, correct? Yeah, the numbers are, are, are paradoxical. So on the one hand, I've been on your show before and saying, hey, you know, the employment from a year ago today to today are virtually always showing increases. I think maybe in 2008, 9, and 10, uh, we saw some years where it was a little bit lower that we actually lost employment one, one year to the next. But usually our conversation is about how many thousand more people are working today than were working a year ago. That circumstance certainly has changed now. Um, if you look at a year ago, June, end of June to a year ago, end of June to now, to end, excuse me, June 2019 to June 2020. Right. Uh, 22,000 fewer people working in this market than there were a year ago. 22,000. That, that, that's a, a humongous number. And to put that in perspective, I think there were 60,000 people at some point or another have filed for unemployment across the state of Nebraska. And with an 8% unemployment rate, which we have right now in this region, as of the end of June, um, that's about 40,000 people um, that are still listed as unemployment and unemployed as of the end of June. And so um, if you think about half of that number basically is, um, is more, are those, half of those numbers would have been employed last year at this time. 
because we were at about three and a half percent, somewhere close to four percent unemployment back then. So um, you know, we we were we got a, a big piece of of unemployment that we're still trying to fix. The other part of that coin, though, is that if you compare May 2020 to June 2020, um, there were 9,000 more people working in June than there were in May. So that means there's been a big uptick in, in June, at least, in the number of people that went back to work. Um, wages are up by about an average of about a buck an hour um, during, that same t- during that same time frame from one year to the next. So there are some positives there, but there's still 22,000 people that are not working that would normally have been working in this market. So we've got, we've got some work to do to get our businesses back to work, who, are, who those folks are unemployed with. And if those folks don't have an employer to go back to, um, how do we get them trained and upskilled so that they become even more productive in our economy um, than they were before? Well, what's the answer to that question? How do you do that? And how fast can that be done? Well, you know, the, the governor um, worked with a lot of organizations over the in the spring to try and figure out what kind of stimulus uh, could be helpful in getting people back to work. And uh, basically, two things were done. There was about three hundred million dollars of the money that was given to the state by the federal government for stimulus that was put out there for businesses for uh, to. Um, provide them some gap cash to say, if you don't have money coming in the door, here's $12,000 of grant money that you can use to kind of keep the doors open. Of course, the federal government also provided what they would call PPP money through the CARES Act that also provided people some dollars to keep people employed during this, this pandemic. Um, and so keeping those businesses open is first, first phase, right? So how do we do that? And then the second part is is that there was about $16 million in the governor's stimulus package that was designed for training and upskilling unemployed workers through the community college network. So uh, we worked very closely with President Schmazel from Metro Community College and the other community colleges across the state and crafted a proposal that provides a, um, I think it's an $1,100 scholarship to folks that are unemployed as a result of, of the pandemic so that they can go to Metro Community College and other community colleges around the state um, and receive training that will result in a full-time job at the end of that training. Um, the commitment of that $16 million, all of it has to be committed by, I think, the end of November. Um, and then um, all the training has to be completed by the end of May next year. So the business community now is partnering with um, uh, Metro and others to try and get the word out to those folks that are unemployed about the kind of jobs that are open. And then we're working with our employers in this region and our peers in Lincoln at the state chamber are doing the same thing to let their members know that um, there are, that employees in those communities know um, that there are, um, there's dollars out there for training and you get companies committed to hiring folks once the training is done. So we've got a lot of work to do between now and really the end of November, but we've got a good path in in front of us and we're working very closely with Metro to make sure that those spots are filled. So as you uh, analyze this right now, given where things appear to be in terms of reality with the pandemic, um, and with the economy as a result of the pandemic, wh- wh- what is the momentum of all this? Where does that take us? Um, and, and, you know, the, one of the reasons I ask that is that the economy has kept going par- partially because people have had, you know, um, money as a result of unemployment compensation and the extra money from the federal government mm-hmm. on top of that. And so they've been able to spend and, and help business. Um, you know, as everybody knows, who knows how long that's going to last. So wh- how do you look at all this? Well, I think um, you asked, your very first question you asked was, how is Omaha doing in all of this? And I think in large measure, you almost got to ask about the broader picture of how is the U.S. doing in all of this? And that really comes down to policymakers and what moves they're making to um, keep business afloat in an environment where this is not a default of businesses being run badly, 
if the result of a pandemic and a public health scenario dramatically impacting businesses and then their potential employment. And so I think the efforts that have been taken so far um, were based on a couple of assumptions that we could get our arms around the pandemic, that in the summertime we would see a reduction in cases as we typically do with the influenza or something like that, and that we could then kind of catch our breath and be ready for um, going back to school and getting businesses back to work in the fall. Instead, what we have found is that this disease has continued on and that it's going to take more focused efforts by all of us to try and control the spread. And that why you're see, that's why you're seeing more and more discussion about the importance of wearing masks and even the mandate in Omaha saying, if you're gonna go in a place of business, you gotta wear a mask. If you're gonna be gathered outside uh, in a place where you can't be socially distanced, you gotta wear a mask. And so trying to keep uh, even being more forceful about controlling the disease that we kind of hoped would kind of control itself over time. That's also then resulting in public policymakers in Washington having to decide if there's gonna be yet another infusion of cash into individuals' pockets and into businesses' pockets to keep those folks employed. Because 70% of our economy is driven by consumer spending. Right. So if, if consumers have money, and we've seen that over these last several months, they will keep spending. Uh, if you look at the retail numbers for the past a couple of months, um, we're starting to see a bit of a dip in consumer spending, um, but it went back up to pretty close to pre-pandemic levels because people still had income coming into their pockets. Now, was there a concern about whether or not their employer can continue giving them income? We're starting to see a little bit of a drop, but if the new CARES Act comes back and they infuse cash back in the system again, we can, we can make our way through all of this while we're getting our arms around the pandemic, but it, it takes both sides. I mean, we can, we got to do what we can to control the pandemic. Um, the health professionals got to do what they can to find a cure or find therapeutics. And the government's got to decide if they're going to be engaged in continuing cash coming in so that we can make sure that the economy just doesn't have uh, fall down off a cliff and we end up with an even worse economic situation than we have today. So we cross our fingers and hope all these things come together the right way, but there, there yeah. are a lot of moving, moving pieces to it. You parts. mentioned that, excuse me. Lots of moving parts and it's complicated by the national election, you know, where politics are always heightened. And, you know, we, we've got to just keep that in the back of our mind that it isn't a normal fall. It's also a presidential election year fall. Yeah. And that means everything is, is more heightened than it would normally be. Yeah. Heightened is, a, is one word for it. <laughs> <laughs> the disposition, the collective disposition of, of, of folks uh, is, uh, has not been a model of decorum, let me put it that way, I guess. It's, it's, well, it's, frankly, it's not just the pandemic, of course. It, it's the, the, the civil unrest that we've seen, the, the response yeah. to um, very, I mean, egregious um, acts against primarily black citizens by police across the country um, that have caused a focus on racism that we never anticipated the level of intensity of, and we have to, we're dealing with that too. I mean, it isn't, it isn't a matter of, guess what, we can just play with COVID. Um, we've got to embrace the notion that Omaha can be better and best uh, if we really are one of the most inclusive communities in the country. And we were planning on that as part of our 2040 plan, which I've talked to you and your viewers about many, many times but it's time to ratchet that up. It's time to say, you know what, Omaha doesn't need to have this as one of those things that we are comfortable with, let's fix this. And so we're seeing a lot more work in that effort too. So we've got these, not only economic recovery we're working with and a pandemic we're working with, but also a commitment to make sure that civil rights is one of our, our key attributes rather than maybe one of our challenges economic and also social and cultural recovery, if you will, all, all mixed together. Yeah. You had mentioned that, you know, and it makes sense that the businesses probably that are struggling the most are the traditional retail kinds of businesses, but that the larger employers have um, collectively done okay or, or, or better. Are there any sectors within that larger employer 
uh, category that are doing better than others or struggling more than others? You know, I, I guess I'm, I'm not seeing it in our region. Um, th there was a, a blip in uh, manufacturing output um, in the early part of, of this pandemic that was that impacted then supply chains, which impacted then transportation um, companies in this market. Um, but we've seen a lot of that turn around and you can, you know, you can look at kind of statements that UP has made or that um, Werner has made about how, what their business has done and how the pandemic has impacted that both their market as well as their people and how they've had to, to, to make a difference here. But they've both been held out as models across the country of companies that have Whether the storm and come out so far doing better. It isn't pre-pandemic levels, but they're doing okay, I think. I mean, that's what the numbers seem to tell me. Um, I think the financial services and insurance industries are continuing on, you know, their path, doing what they're doing. I think financial services had to respond dramatically during the pandemic with the CARES Act funding all flowing through them. Um, that was a big deal. And I, I think they've, they've, they've responded very well. As a matter of fact, Nebraska uh, banks responded better than anybody else in the country. So it really was, it was really well done. We had more, higher percentage of our businesses took advantage of the PPP loans than anywhere else in the country. Um, and it all flowed through banks, community banks, larger banks, all of them said, we're going to do this, we're going to do it right, and their, their customers benefited from it. Um, the essential service companies have continued to function the way you know that, that they need to, and um, have done a nice job again of that. So I, I don't, I don't see any that have potentially been impacted any more negatively than others. Um, it it all relates to how you are managing your people assets, and um, are you doing it safely, and are you doing it in a productive way? And I think our companies have responded very very well. You know, there are some real uh, encouraging and positive things to talk about. Um, and there are a number of post-pandemic uh, post rankings that have come out. I just want to touch on one of them right now. And that's the idea that theoretically this area could benefit maybe uh, to significantly by the exodus of people leaving places like New York and California, yeah. right? Yeah, it's an interesting, there's a whole bunch of literature out there about the folks that are leaving the more densely populated uh, communities in this country and headed for, for places that are less densely populated, um, have less crime, um, have less um, impact from the pandemic. Um, and if you look at, at why they're looking at places, it's all the things that we've talked about at Omaha for a long time, you know, lower community times, lower cost of housing, higher education, or higher quality public education, uh, better medical care, all the things that we've said are, are things that people should look at. Those have all been attributes that have been listed in the literature that said people are looking for. And so, you know, we're actively engaged in getting the messaging out about Omaha as a, a, a more reasonable choice. If you're going to leave the big city, you might as well go to a place that has a really high quality of life. And whether you're a millennial or a, a boomerang or, um, you know, Frankly, anybody that has any kind of connection to Nebraska, uh, we're trying to encourage them to, to come here and think about this as a place to live. Have we seen any evidence of that? And there was actually a, a rating about this, right? This Yeah. A I, 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 yes, there is one. And Jill will shoot me because I can't keep the numbers all straight in my head. She might have provided that to you, Kent. Um, but there are dozens of anecdotal examples of business people that I've talked to who all know somebody who has moved here from the East Coast to the West Coast, or they know somebody who knows somebody who's, who has done it. Yeah. The numbers keep growing. And what's intriguing is that there are executives who basically have closed up shop in, let's say, Manhattan and said, you know, I got to get my family out of here. I want to go to a safer place. Uh, let's go near where we have family in Iowa or Nebraska. I can do my job from remotely from there just as much as I could do it from my apartment in downtown Manhattan. But my kids will be safer. My family will be safer. They'll have better schools to go to. And, you know, maybe I can actually do my business there even after the pandemic. And so let's make this a full-time move. So That's cool. very cool. 
Yeah, so we're hearing that more and more. And I, I, like, I like to hear it because I think they'll start talking to their friends who um, are wondering what they're doing and why they're doing it out in Nebraska. And it'll end up becoming something that we can turn into an advantage for us. You bet. Talk about LB 1107 uh, passed by the legislature. It looks to me like that was a very big win. It was a big deal. So I think I've talked to your audience many times about the importance of business incentives and that the in incentive bill, the incentive law that we had in place, um, the, Nebraska, the Nebraska Advantage Act, was set to sunset at the end of 2020. And we've been working now for about three years to try and replace it uh, with a bill that would be even better than what we had before, uh, but, but that would ensure that we still had incentives available to offer businesses that were already in Nebraska that wanted to expand or we're considering Nebraska for new investments. And um, it has been a tough road uh, to get this bill passed. Um, we've, we have found ourselves in a situation where there's a, a major issue of property tax relief being discussed at the same time that we had to do the business incentive bill. And the two of them basically were looking at each other saying, this isn't gonna pass if this doesn't pass. And oh, by the way, if this isn't gonna pass, if this doesn't pass. And we had, we had yet to find a mechanism for getting that, those bills passed. And then to complicate matters, last fall, the University of Nebraska Medical Center announced the, their proposed, the, their partnership with the Department of Defense to build what they call the next project, which is about a two and a half billion dollar project on the University of Nebraska Med Center campus that will um, house uh, a, a couple of towers, one that will be mainly a research tower on, of all things, how to deal with pandemics and how to train folks across the world on being better at planning for and responding to pandemics and to other biohazards. And then the other tower would, would be a hospital tower that could replace old and aging facilities that are currently on the campus. 8,700 high paying jobs um, at the basically the the Saddle Creek end of our urban core area in Midtown, and it required the state to put in some kind of a match. And I think the match was about $300 million in return for about you know, 2.2 billion of investment from philanthropy, from business, and from the federal government. And so that was thrown onto the table and attached to um, our incentive bill. So now we have three big issues that are all okay. kind of facing us, um, all three of them desirous, and all three of them having kind of different constituents to get a pass. Um, the good news is at the end of it all, um, the legislature came together and put all three of those bills into one bill called LB 1107. And it, uh, it passed overwhelmingly in the legislature uh, during the second half of their um, short session uh, that they had to end because of, of the pandemic um, in, in June. So the good news is after all that work, um, we have support for the next project. We have property tax relief um, in, in place, and we have an incentive bill that will make us even more competitive for more and more projects coming down the pike. So big, big deal. Um, gives us a chance to start looking at other issues as we move through the legislature for the next few years. And what do you have in mind in that respect? Forward, yeah. this is accomplished. You know, we're still building agenda, but you know, we've talked about Blueprint Nebraska uh, in the past and an initiative that Blueprint is looking at right now is what does comprehensive tax reform look like so we can have more competitive taxes. I don't know if we'll be ready for the 2021 session or not for that, but there's a, a significant effort moving forward to say, now that we've got ourselves kind of stabilized and we know what this is like, Maybe we should look at how we generate tax revenue and support services in the state. And is there a more competitive way to do that? And so there's a, there's a task force that's kind of working on that right now. There's discussions about housing across the state. There's discussions about broadband or across the state. There's discussions about transportation across the state. So all of those task forces are working. And frankly, all of those have an underlying theme of how do we do this in a way recognizing that our demographics are going to change and that we need to keep in mind diversity, equity, and inclusion as we're making all of these decisions about what the future is going to look like. So it's, a, it's not a small undertaking, but I think we'll bubble up plenty of, of uh, legislative initiatives coming out of that blueprint in Nebraska. 
yeah, now that 1107 has uh, been successfully accomplished, it's this forward-looking, uh, the forward-looking issues are under the category of what have you done for us lately, David? You know, come on, let's get going. Right, right. there's always that. I mean, I, I told you the story of the College World Series when we announced uh, the new stadium being built. And signed, everybody signed the dotted line on one day, and I was giving a, report, a speech to our Rotary Club the next and the very first question was, well, now that we got the College Road Series Stadium done, what are we going to do next? I mean, we, the ink was not <laughs> deeper yet. And people were saying, what's the next big project? So there's always yeah. a big project, which is great. Sure. And we're seeing a lot of new ones coming out of the ground. And that's a good thing about Omaha. We can always expect something big coming down the pipe. Speaking of uh, business incentives, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but the, the company is it Vario, Vario in Plattsmouth, Vario. Yeah, Vario, yeah. The groundbreaking for that. That's a that was that has that comes under that category to some degree, doesn't it? That's a and that's a big deal, twenty million dollar deal. So we've still had successes. I mean, this year I think we're at forty some million for year to date so far in capital investments, and um, you know we're probably up around eight hundred jobs that have been announced, and we've got a couple of other big ones that are going to be announced here in September, October that we've been working on. So it isn't like we haven't continued economic development work. I mean, we have. Vireo is a cool project, it's in Cass County. It you know started out as a relatively small um, kind of natural foods um, supplement kind of company and they have grown their, um, their market share and you can see them in most of the larger retailers now. And so they needed more space. And so they, they're expanding their operation and gives them opportunity to grow even more in the future. So it's a great project. Well, that would not have been done had it not been for the, an adequate amount of uh, incentive. Oh, they were clear about that in their discussion that um, absent the incentives and absent the cities of Plattsmouth willing, willingness to work with them um, on infrastructure and those kinds of things, uh, they could not have done this project. So um, you're, you're kind of preaching to the choir a little bit here, or maybe I am, but I don't I believe that all the 900 projects or so that we've landed since 2004, that every one of them was competitive and every one of them required some level of local or state incentive to land here. The folks that don't like incentives dispute that, but that's their prerogative. But our, our data is real clear. And my experience sitting across the table from companies is abundantly clear. Absent incentives, we aren't competitive. And so we had right. to have in place. And we keep seeing more and more companies say that as we, as we land them here in this market. But how much more will 1107 enhance that part of the equation? You know, 1107 um, is in large measure um, a bill that is still credit-based, so you still got to do the work before you get any kind of incentive. You still got to make the capital investments and hire the people before you get any incentive. We've, we've targeted higher wages. We've allowed those tax credits to be used for a broader set of purposes. Um, and we've streamlined the administrative process so that it, it is much more favorable to a company knowing that we, we promised it to them and they know they're going to get it and their, their opportunity to get the credits happens faster rather than slower. So um, it's a better bill than what we had before. It will result in, in higher wage projects. It will result in um, projects across the state. There's some language in there that allows for incentives for blighted areas in urban areas in the, the, the state that wasn't in the last bill. Um, and it actually gives more credits for higher wages. So the higher the wages you pay, um, the more credits that you can earn. So it, it really is targeted at bringing in higher wage companies, um, doing more for small manufacturers, more for blighted areas, um, and being really flexible about how you can use those tax credits for things that might be um, talent or benefit related services that you can provide now, whereas before you're really limited in how you could use those tax credits. Gotcha. Let's talk a little bit more, a couple more minutes on the uh, focus about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Cause I know that that is something that is a big focus. Um, talk a little bit about the, what is the CEOs for code? Sure. I read something about that. So in, you may recall again that we did the 20, Omaha 2040 strategy in um, 2017, and it identified the fact that from a demographic perspective, 
the population in Nebraska and the population in Omaha was going to change dramatically between now and 2040. So much so that by 2040, we believe that Omaha will be a predominantly non-white population. To give you a comparison, today we're about 25% non-white. And so if you think about what that move means over the next 20 years, that we will be 51% non-white. And so that's a big yeah. difference, right? And so yes. we put in place a program called CODE, which was, is, stands for our commitment to opportunities for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we had our first diversity conference last fall. And out of that conference, we put together a group called CEOs for Code, which are CEOs of local companies who have agreed to sign a pledge. And that pledge says that um, they will identify um, an, an individual in their organization who will be responsible for tracking the uh, provision of information and education and processes and policies that will help companies be more effective in hiring diverse employees and more effective in creating an inclusive culture. And that they would go through an assessment of their employees and their senior team every year and then use that as a tool to enhance their ability to be more diverse employers. So this was like a pledge type thing? Yeah, it's called a code pledge. Yep. And and so at, at the time, I think we had, well, over the last year, we've, I think we've got, we had 25 or 26 companies that signed up. Our goal was to have a company, 100 companies sign the code pledge by 2023. Um, so that CEOs for Code, it had a couple of meetings. The most recent one had, having been at last year's um, conference in the fall. And, um, and then this fall, the, or this spring of, of the unfortunate incidents, the egregious incident in, with, Dr., with Mr. Floyd in Minnesota um, happened on a Friday evening and it just so happened that we already had a meeting scheduled of the CEOs for code the following Wednesday. It was gonna be a Zoom meeting and we had 40 or so companies signed up to participate. By the time that Wednesday got here, we had 156 companies on the call. Wow. It was abundantly clear that all of those CEOs said, you know what, this is, this is time. It's time for us to fix this. This is not what Omaha is all about. And so we need to fix this. And so for the next week, we engaged with them and developed a set of pledges that came out as a document um, that we called the We Will Pledge. And that We Will Pledge had six pledges in it. And I'm going to play with this real quickly. Sure. I think you can see that we will pledge behind me. Um, yeah. And it was a full page ad in the paper. And, and it said, you know, um, we, we think we should be doing something more specific, more aggressive about making sure that racism is just not part of, of Omaha. And so CEOs for Code took that on. And we have been working with this group now to, to develop a set of diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies that we would implement so that companies can more quickly um, start working towards being more diverse employers. We ended up with 270 companies signed this We Will Pledge. And that We Will Pledge basically said these are the six things that we will do as a business community and as businesses to make a difference. So now we're working on putting the programs around the We Will Pledge, stuff that we're doing, and also stuff that we can partner with other organizations. And so there's a significant move afoot to help companies be, be more diverse employers and to have more inclusive culture. And then how do we do that same thing for the community so that we have amenities here that are reflective of the population that is here now and that will be here in the future. All very good stuff. Um, as I always like to do, I want to just throw it open to you for anything else you'd like to add before we, we say so long for this, uh, for this episode. Um, anything we didn't touch on that you, know, I don't you think, want to make like, sure the community knows? Yeah, I just might reiterate that, you know, this, with everybody with their head down on this, the pandemic and the, the civil rights issue, it's kind of hard, it's kind of easy to miss the big picture things that are happening across the community. Um, you know, we, we can't forget that the world hasn't stopped just because we're all fighting this thing in our, in our families and our, our businesses, et cetera. I mean, so keep in mind, the Riverfront Project continues forward. 
the, the mm -hmm. ConAgra redevelopment project is continuing forward. The project at the old mill continuing forward. The Cuba Corporation headquarters project continuing forward. Um, the Crossroads Mall project was announced. It's a $500 million project. Um, Midtown continues you know, to grow. Um, Exarban Village continues to grow. Um, the, the old Boys Town property, Hartwood Preserve, that continues to grow. There's still a lot of things in this market that continue to see new investment being announced and new projects happening. And that's not happening everywhere across the country. So I say that as a bit of a, maybe a confidence boost that has stopped working. Good things are happening and we need to keep that in mind. We do need to keep our nose to the grindstone to get rid of this pandemic and to do better on civil rights. But we'll come out of this better and we just need to be optimistic that that'll happen sooner rather than later. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's easy to, um, you know, within the confines of, sitting at your computer all day long and not getting out as much as, as normal over this, right. this first uh, part of 2020, you lose sight of some of that stuff. Right. And I, I don't know, are you doing a lot of Zoom meetings? You haven't done very many of them, have you, over the last ah. three or four months? <laughs> I counted them yesterday. I had 15 Zoom meetings yesterday. Um, <laughs> and, you know, even for me who likes to talk and listen, that's a lot. Um, we're doing all no, of that. My no, no wonder you, you, no wonder you were so delighted to see my 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 sunshiny <laughs> face when we when we started this. <laughs> How we do business today, so that's okay. You know, we'll keep doing what we can to to keep the gears work turning. So, you bet. Okay, gonna, David. Thank, thank you. Go ahead. Take care of yourself and be safe. Okay. Okay. Thank you, David. Appreciate it very much. And that's going to do it for this edition of uh, MCC TV. Thank you for being with us. Our goal is to better acquaint you with the mission, the leadership, and the reach of the college, along with David Brown. I'm Kent Pavelka for Metropolitan Community College. <laughs>